Hey everyone, I'm Matt Cremona. And I'm Matthew Morse. And welcome to the Matt and Matthew Show. So today we have a special guest with us, um, Jeff Miller. Um, Jeff, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? I'm Jeff Miller. And um, thank you so much for being on the show today. We really appreciate it. Um, so just for people who may possibly not know you, which may be about a tenth of the people who are watching, um, can you give them a little background on yourself real quick? Sure. I've been building furniture now for, it's coming up on 33 years. Before that, I was a professional musician. Um, I, I guess it's been, oh, 18 years or so that since I started teaching and writing, um, written, I don't even know how many articles for fine woodworking and popular woodworking, and I'm working on my fifth book right now, a book that, at least in my mind, is titled uh, Furniture Design Companion. Um, previous books include The Foundations of Better Woodworking, Chairmaking and Design, Beds, and Children's Furniture. And then I was in a couple of other compilation books as well. So you said you were a musician first. So so did you go to school for being a woodworker? Did, did you go to a woodworking school or did you, how'd you move into that? I went to school to be a musician, um, but not to be a woodworker. I just started doing this. Actually, the first woodworking that I did was musical instrument making. And I had read a book that was fascinating to me and it talked about making uh, sort of replicas of Renaissance and Baroque woodwind instruments and for some reason that ignited something in my mind and I went off and found the shop where I was able to do that um, ostensibly with somebody's supervision but actually not they just kind of let me do their do my own thing while they did their thing and then I made some furniture because I had an empty apartment while I was doing that and this was just this was really just on a break in college and then I went back and went on and got a master's degree in music and then performed for a few years and then switched over and started doing woodworking learning the whole time I may be wrong but I remember somewhere reading one of your books and like you decided to build some chairs for was it yourself and a dining table was that it uh, yeah I needed I needed furniture for my apartment and there was a book, um, the Sunset Book of Tables and Chairs. Um, and it had some terrible chair designs in it, but they were within my technical skill at the time, which was non-existent. And so I built the set of chairs and a table. The table seemed pretty easy. And then I, once I had started in business, I had a customer who was actually interested in a table and she asked if I could do chairs as well, and I said, oh, sure, I can do chairs. And that was what really started me down this, you know, sort of fun and peculiar path that I'm on, which is predominantly uh, concentrating on chairs, although I've done all kinds of furniture over the years. So, Jeff, then when did you start doing your teaching then? I, the teaching sort of came about at the same time I started writing, and um, I don't remember what actually got me going on it. It just felt like I had stuff to share at the time. And um, it was pretty exciting. I love meeting people and being able to help. Um, over the years, I've learned a tremendous amount from students, but also learned a tremendous amount about teaching students. And one of the things that's particularly interesting is sort of reaching back into my music education and um, applying some of the methods I learned there for learning music to uh, sort of woodworking pedagogy. And so that was kind of the, the basis of the book I've got, The Foundations of Better Woodworking. And that's really all about talking um, about the real fundamentals, the, the essential things that you need to know, how to use your body, what you need to understand about wood, um, and how to use your tools so that they all become extensions of what you're trying to do, which is what a musician is trying to do. Everything they do is supposed to be at the service of uh, what's going on. So now that you 
been a teacher and you also were a student at one time and you've been building furniture in between, um, where do you, at what point do you think your skills really evolved or you hit that, that neck, that step where you felt comfortable enough to say, I'm going to go start selling now for a living? Uh, that's not necessarily how it worked. Um, I think starting my business, I was 27 when I started and I didn't really know better and I was selling stuff right off the bat and I wasn't bad um, at the beginning and had some decent designs to start with that uh, where this came from I have no idea but everything has evolved tremendously over the years um, you know originally I learned from everything I could read which at the time was uh, five or six years worth of fine woodworking and a few woodworking books. But I just constantly kept at it. And I think the biggest teacher, aside from absorbing everything I could from everybody around me, was the fact that I was designing stuff and designing things that weren't necessarily within my reach as a maker. And so I was forced to learn how to make things that were much more complicated. And because I knew I had, it was my design, I sort of bought into it. I really pushed with every new project to increase my skills. And that's still very much the case. And I'm probably pushing harder than ever now with some of my designs. And they're, you know, they're pretty crazy. Yeah, well, you've just developed, you have two brand new chairs. Well, relatively brand new. You've been working on them for a while, right? The, um the rocker as well as, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name properly, but it starts with a T, the... Takata chairs. Um, I, I also name a lot of my furniture after musical forms, just as a, as a sort of tribute back to former career. But also because they sometimes reflect something about the designs. Uh, the Takata chairs are, I, I don't know, they're certainly the most comfortable things I've ever design to date and um, they work really well. They're exciting designs. They're, they're visually uh, really interesting and I'm really pleased with them. I'm actually working right now on another one of the rockers. Um, just about done and looking forward to getting that to, to the customer. And then, you know, there are more designs. I'm working on a new one right now that is currently um, in the shop in, in the crudest of forms, drywall screws, two by fours, bent plywood stuff. Um, it's in a high stool, sort of a bar stool height form right now, but I see it much more as an easy chair down the road, but I've got somebody who might be interested in it in this form, so I'm going ahead with this right now. And this one poses its own challenges. So it's always, always something that's, that's getting going here and getting me going and getting me learning. So one thing that I really like about your work, Jeff, is that the, the things you make have such an artistry to them, but I think you focus more than anyone I know of that really they, they, they take the artistry of a piece and they really work extremely hard to make it extremely functional. So I know, for instance, your chairs, they're not only beautiful, but they're extremely comfortable. How did you kind of get into that? Or what was the progression of you getting into like, I want to make the most comfortable chairs imaginable? I think the original focus of what I was doing was to make a comfortable chair. And that's surprisingly challenging to do because we've gotten so used to uncomfortable chairs in everything we do around us. I mean, you sit anywhere and the chairs are, are sort of ridiculously uncomfortable. And I, uh, you know, started out with sort of bizarre experiments in making chairs comfortable. And what I discovered was that the curves that make a chair comfortable are curves that really are intriguing for design. And they're very easy to work with to make exciting designs. Um, and, you know, there's no way to know where a style starts or, or even 
uh, how it evolves in particular. I mean, I started out making shaker and craftsman furniture, and eventually I got to a place where I think the pieces, the chairs I'm doing in particular, look like my chairs. And they don't really look like other people's chairs. And I don't know when that really started. Um, I don't know really how that started, but that's the product of 30 years of, of constant design and pushing and I think very much influenced by the body and the beautiful curves that, that come from the body. I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> I think it does. <laughs> so since you're, we are leading in curves, um, not only, I mean, you do a ton of work in curves, obviously, as you've been talking about and anybody's seen your work before, um, but the, the problems you're solving as far as joinery with the curves to me is, all, is, is like the, the inside view of the rocking chair, the joint where the, the yeah, everything for the back support and the leg and it's all coming together. I mean, it's, a, a, it's an amazing um, piece of, of joinery right there. So you know, how do those, that thought process of solving that problem, how does that come to you or how do you work through that? I do a lot of prototyping, a lot of mock-ups, and I lie awake a lot, a lot at night just sort of putting these things together in my head and trying to figure out how they possibly can, can work. And I start out with, you know, what has to happen in this joint? And then kind of work my way through that. Um, I rely heavily on traditional joinery, oddly enough but not exclusively on that. And so I've come up with some interesting stuff and I'm not afraid, you know, in certain situations to just put some screws in somewhere and, and hide it and, and do joinery that way. Um, it reinforces what's going on with the other traditional joints. It's never just that, it's always that in addition to something else that's structural as well. Um, I, it's, you know, it's also building something up over years and years of experience. And I just keep finding stranger and stranger requirements of how to join things and look around and try and figure it out. Now, is that because of the requests you're getting from your clients for the type of furniture they want you to build? It's because my designs just sort of call for it. I, uh, that design was sort of this branching of all these different components and then it's almost like a, a leaf or a flower petal unfurling for the seat and I, there, I had to come up with a way to do that and in order for that vision to come to life and luckily I did. I mean sometimes you can't do it and the vision gets scrapped and you just move on from there. But um, with that one, I felt really fortunate in that I came up with a really good idea for how to do it and went with that. It's, it's absurdly difficult to do, but I, it's kind of enjoyable to be out on the, for, on the frontier like that and sort of hacking my way through and, and discovering new ways of, of putting wood together at the service of a design idea that I think is worth it. It sounds like you wouldn't want to have it any other way. <laughs> Maybe that's all rationalization, but I, I think that's true. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I, I'm pretty pleased with uh, at least the fact that I'm still excited about designing and enjoying uh, coming up with new designs. And I think the my most recent designs are, are better than they've been since I started. So that's something that makes me very happy. So you have all these pieces you've built over the years. Is there any one in particular that you love building more than any others? Or is it every new one is the one that you're looking to build next? It really, I mean, there are a handful that I really like a lot and, and go back and revisit, but the one I tend to fall in love with at the moment is the most recent one because I'm pouring all of my heart and soul into it. And um, 
uh, it tends to be what I get excited about. Uh, I may not move away from these Takata chairs too easily in terms of uh, not loving those, but uh, at least I'm excited about the newer ones as well. You build other stuff, Jeff, besides chairs. Oh, sure. I mean, you're known for the chairs, but you, you build some beautiful tables and, and beds as well. Yeah, I mean, I, earlier on in my career, I built way more beds than, than chairs. And I mean, that was sort of the genesis for the book on building beds, was that I'd done so many of them, um, hundreds, that it was just, it, it made sense to share what the, the basic uh, setup I, I came up with for dealing with them, with people. And it made it easier for me, and it certainly, I hope, makes it easier for other people to, to build beds as well. Um, you know, it's funny, I, I have made some fun tables, I really enjoy that, but nothing is as exciting as building the chairs, and nothing is as, is as challenging as building the chairs either. So, yeah, I'm happy to say I'm a chair maker who makes lots of other furniture as well. Yeah, I, I love it too. I'm, um, I, well, you, you saw the rocker at WIA, I and mean, that was a, a big thing for me. The, the green and green inspired one, yes. Yeah, and um, I, so chairs are just, for me, I, I guess, and the same for you too, they're so fascinating and there's so much going on and you can be so, um, um, uh, you can really reach out more so than you, than maybe, potentially, at least to me, at least on a four-sided object. It's really the only piece of furniture that people kind of wear. <laughs> um, you know, somebody interacts with it in a, in a very different way than they interact with anything else. Sure, you lie on a bed, but you're lying on the mattress. The bed is just a bed frame holding up the mattress. In the chair, it influences you, your comfort, how you look. Um, uh, to some extent, it's a status symbol, and uh, there are all sorts of interesting psychological and social things attached to it that make it even more fascinating to, to design it as an object. So Jeff, I just want to go back to your teaching for a little bit here. Um, as your career has progressed now, how much time do you spend now in the shop building uh, furniture pieces as opposed to uh, doing your teaching or doing your writing? The teaching is is more and more um, in the last few years. This year, um, lots of travel around and, and teaching, and, and I enjoy that a lot. Um, sometimes to the detriment of, of my productivity in the shop, but at the same time, I think my career started transitioning in a big, big way with the recession. And I was really lucky in that just about the time that furniture sales started drying up just everywhere and for everybody, the teaching started to explode a little bit. And uh, I went with that for, for a while. So Jeff, probably my, one of my favorite books on woodworking is your um, foundations book. I thought that was just an amazing book just from the standpoint that it was so unique to what everyone else was doing as far as woodworking books go because it just starts at like it's such a basic level like here's how you physically do this task to make it easier and more effective. Um, is that just something you kind of came up with as you're working in your shop or what was your progression to get to a point where like I'm going to write about how to physically do woodworking? Well uh it, it goes back to two things, really. One is that I was a musician, and musicians sort of pay attention to that sort of stuff. In order to use, in order to make music at the highest level, you need to pay incredible attention to how your body functions. It's not just something that happens because you want it to happen. And musicians work on these things. And the other thing, the other impetus for that, I guess there were two other things. One was teaching classes and seeing time and time again what people lacked and then what made a difference. So I'd get a student who you know, had taken six other dovetail classes and came to me and had no idea why they still couldn't cut a dovetail. And it was apparent just from how they were standing at the workbench 
that they didn't know how to use their body for this stuff. And once they started paying attention to that, everything else fell into place beyond that. So it was this foundational thing that, and then the last component was that nobody else really was talking about that as a, as a thing that you needed to think about when you were uh, learning to do woodworking. Uh, most of the articles are on projects or on specific techniques and here and there it's how to do this or how to do that, but it's not getting down to the level that you were talking about, which is this is how you use your body or this is what the tool really is doing or this is what the structure of wood has to say about you trying to cut it this way. And there was this gaping hole in woodworking literature and a tremendous need for the information that you couldn't really find. And so I just sort of jumped into it. That's awesome. It's it's a great book. I really I think if anyone watching this hasn't hasn't taken a look at that book, you totally should. We'll have a link to that in the notes down below for sure. Well, thank you. It's I'm glad you enjoyed it. You also did a companion video to the book as well, right? Exactly. I worked on that with Popular Woodworking and we did um, it was kind of interesting working with David Teal on that. Um, you know, he was sort of my guinea pig for some of the techniques that we were talking about there and uh, attempting to show in, you know, in video form some of what I was talking about. Uh, you can only see so much in photographs. And certainly my photographer, Tanya, was terrific at, at showing things in the book, but the video does show a lot of things that you can't quite cover in, in words and, and pictures. Um, and so then you said you have a new book on Horizon. Are you allowed to talk about that or? Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, uh, there's another kind of gaping hole in, in the woodworking literature, or at least there has been since the 70s. Um, uh, Seth Stem back then wrote a book on designing furniture, and there really hasn't been anything since then. And I wanted to treat that topic in a way that I'm hoping will be inspiring because designing furniture is first and foremost solving problems and most people are pretty good at solving problems and also pretty hung up about what design is all about. Um, I don't know very many woodworkers who feel comfortable with design and yet they all feel like they're great problem solvers and I think finding the way to use the problem solving angle of things in design as well as tapping into some creativity and, and learning a little bit about the rules of design um, can be a real eye-opening experience for people. And I think, you know, certainly for me, design was the path to technical woodworking skills. And I think that that is a surprisingly strong path to getting better as a woodworker. Um, but again, there isn't much out there that really talks about it, and certainly not from, from people who design. Now, besides the books, people come and learn from you directly as well. So you said earlier you travel for teaching, um, but you also teach classes at your shop. Is, is that correct? Absolutely. Um, I've got seven workbenches here in the shop. Um, six of them I made and they're you know it's all high quality or highest quality workbenches and uh, there's plenty of space and lots of equipment here and I have been teaching here since 1997 I think um, it certainly exploded more in in terms of teaching all around the country but in the next year, I'm going to have to pull back and teach more here. Um, some health issues that mean I won't be able to travel as easily um, kind of force me to concentrate on teaching around here. So that's what I'll be doing, is emphasizing classes here. And I, I don't yet have my schedule up and running. I'm hoping to get that together at the end of November once I know what some of my healthcare stuff looks like um, for real. 
So even though you don't know your schedule, what kind of things can people look forward to that you would be offering class-wise? Well, I teach a lot of weekend workshops and that'll continue um, cutting dovetail joints, mortise and tendon joints, um, shaping and bending curves, which is obviously something I do a whole lot of, uh, a bunch of other topics like that, uh, you know, learning to use your hand tools, sharpen them, tune them up, and then a whole bunch of interesting exercises to get better at your hand tool skills and we just kind of go around the room it's almost like going to the gym and doing circuit training and we do circuit training with hand tool exercises each bench is set up with a different exercise and after a little while we rotate um, but then i also teach project classes uh, again concentrating on chair making classes next year i'll do a, uh, a chippendale chair class that i have taught and um, we'll do that here in the shop, which will be fun because access to all of my stuff as well and a little bit easier than shipping all that elsewhere. And then probably some other chair classes, maybe some stools, and then some smaller projects, some sort of weekend-based projects. All of that um, in, in a kind of nice environment. And the shop here is an old, I think, 1920s, built uh, 1920s era post office, uh, red brick building, 22 foot ceilings in places, and uh, really spacious and open, lots of light, and uh, lots of fun. You're probably in one of the most unique buildings or shops, at least that from what we've, who people we've talked to so far. So how did you get a post office for yourself? <laughs> It, it had been decommissioned as a post office and turned into all kinds of other things over the years. And it, had, it was a block away from my old shop and it was sitting vacant for a while. And I finally called up the, the owner and said, hey, look, you know, that's been sitting vacant for a couple of years. Do you want to sell it? And uh, we got lucky and came to an agreement and fixed it up for, for my purposes. And there are two spaces in here that I've been able to rent out, which certainly helps sustain a, a woodworking business, which is not always the most constant in, in income. And uh, it's been here for, I guess, 22 years now. Well, a very pleasant mess it is. I'm finally starting to get to the point where I need to go through and throw things out on a regular basis because I don't even remember what some of the jigs are for anymore. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, I'll pick up something and, yeah, that looks familiar, but I don't remember the piece. So it's not worth keeping around if I don't remember what I used it for. Well, I don't know about you, Matt, but I'd definitely like to come out and do some time with you this year, if it's, or coming year, if it's possible, maybe a week or, or, or four months. No, I'm just kidding, Jeff. <laughs> I don't want to scare you too much. <laughs> sure. Well, by all means, uh, you know. It'd be great to have you guys out here. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to seeing that when you get the classes up, I'll definitely have to check that out. Um, speaking of which, we haven't asked you, we usually do this a little bit later, but while we're here talking about it, so how can people find you if they wanna find you um, for your the classes, your website, everything? Sure, sure, sure. It's a, it's a very easy website. It's www.furnituremaking.com. Um, there's a blog there, there's a slightly out of date portfolio of my stuff, um, a listing of the classes and some other information as well. Uh, the blog is sporadically updated, it's not uh, as often as I would like, but there's some interesting stuff on there. And uh, certainly check there first for the classes and, and what's going on here. And are you on any other types of social media platforms? Um, I am on Facebook, Handcrafted Furniture, I think. Um, Twitter, Handcrafted Fern, F-U-R-N. Um, and I have an Instagram account, but I don't think I have used it yet. Oh, you got to get up there. I mean, we're, we're posting all the time, right, Matt? I lose it all the time constantly. It's so, it's so addictive. You get so much inspiration from Instagram, just scrolling through there, looking to see what everybody's working on. There are only so many hours in a day, and, and I don't like to spend too many of those hours in front of a computer screen as opposed to 
in front of a piece of wood um, or a piece that I'm working on. So uh, it's, it's, it's hard work to get me in front of the computer screen. And you got to make the, the, the big bucks too, so. Right, right, right. You can't be sitting on the phone the whole time. You got it. I would like to ask you one question we've asked everybody in the past. And that question is, um, if you were to give a younger you advice from what you've learned up to this point in your life, woodworking wise, what would that be? Get in the shop and do a lot of work. Um, you know, I, I was able to read some things and learn from that. And certainly there are vastly more resources now in terms of YouTube videos and regular DVDs and books and it's, it's sort of endless. And what I see most people doing is getting lost in that instead of going out to the shop and, and working. It's only wood, buy cheap wood to start with and make things. And mess up the wood and make mistakes because that's by far the best way to actually learn this. Um, nobody's going to keep you from making mistakes by showing, you know, you're not going to keep yourself from making mistakes by watching a YouTube video. And I think the other thing that is available now that you should avail yourself of are classes. And there's just a wealth of really great woodworking education around the country right now. Um, terrific teachers, uh, really coast to coast, and terrific schools from coast to coast where you can go and learn from some of the best people out there. And that's a real step up from just hanging in your shop and making mistakes because you've got somebody looking over you who can correct what's going on. And it's not just somebody who shows you techniques, it's show somebody who analyzes what you're doing and, and helps you to get better at what you're trying to do. Well, thank you so much for, for being here today, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. It was great talking to you. And again, everybody, go and check out Jeff's work. Maybe sign up for some classes, pick up one of his books. Everything he does is awesome. So. Be sure you check out his stuff. If you want to take a look and see anything about me, you can head over to my website. I'm at mattcremona.com. And how can we find you, Matthew? And for me, it's mmwoodstudio.com, all the social media, all that crazy stuff. And as always, guys, please subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, and uh, we'll see you guys in a few weeks. Thanks, Jeff, for being with us. Thanks. It's been a pleasure.